It's important that we start meetings on time, right? Part of our norms. <laughs> okay, so I'll just do really, really boring stuff first. If you're presenting, feel free to use this. You don't. That's not actually a microphone. It's like a audio recorder, so you don't need to like, you know, do anything like that unless you really want to. Um, Cass wants to, obviously. Uh, and I don't think there's anything else. So hopefully you found the toilet down that way. Otherwise, we're all good. Um, so myself and Josh and Brenna organised this mostly on the internet, and it was easy. Pretty easy, I would say. So if you want to host your own, it's really quite easy. I think it just happened for a weekend, didn't it? It was like Friday. One of us said we'd like to do one of these, and by Sunday it was pretty much organised. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we're saying that in hopes of. If you want to do this one, if you're very inclined for it to help you out. Okay. Alright, um, rather than me do a bad welcome to country, we're going to watch this, so bear with us. And then we'll start it off. So, um, this is me uh, asking about instructional video and flip learning. Always try to make those separate because you sort of need the skills to make instructional video to do flip learning, which is a pedagogy. So, I start with the first one, and very few people get to the second, I feel. Um, Edu Reading is an online academic thing I run. We read an article and we use Flipgrid to share videos. There's a couple of people in here who do that already. And I've just come back from Cambodia and so Teachers Across Borders Australia is one of my things. So, I've got two minutes. Josh and myself will be sitting here timing just in case anyone goes ludicrously over time, which I'm <laughs> now quite nervous that I will be doing. Um, so basically, I'm presenting at the National Education Summit on instructional video rather than learning. This is something I made up. Today, I'm just going to give you this very simple one, using a phone as a document camera or an external document camera. And ideally, you should be able to do it without any new technology or any new purchases. So, this is what I showed to my staff last year. I got a couple of meter rulers and some chairs, and I made my own document camera just to show them that it's less about having fancy technology, which I tend to have, mm -hmm. but that's kind of, it's more the thought process rather than the things that I bought that sort of give me a skill set. So my iPhone or my Surface Pro, and I used to, I did this for about a year and a half to make videos, and then eventually I sort of thought this is a bit ridiculous, and you know, almost cracked a couple of phones and screens, and so then I had to upgrade. Um, and this was my next upgrade, so you go onto eBay and you get a little plastic pocket from China for $6, a little flexible arm to hover whatever device you have over a phone. And again, I did this for probably half a year or a year and a half. I even had students at the front of the room annotating our English texts and recording it and then putting it unlisted on YouTube so that next year they could watch that and say, oh, they weren't very good. And then the next year and so on, they sort of built onto each other. And then finally, if you want to upgrade, you get a Hypego ZVXR or some fancy name like that for about 250 bucks. It's got a light, autofocus, microphone, and all those sort of things. And that's what I use now. Uh, so obviously that's not very interesting. Second option is just download this program and set it up, and then you can record anything that you do on the screen of your computer. And so you can basically show students tutorials in 10 to 20 seconds. Um, I've taught year 8 kids how to use this and they've made their own, so it's very low bar uh, kind of to entry type stuff. And then finally, the interesting thing. So um, the device that I just showed you is currently at a, one of our art teacher's homes and she is using it to film art things. I'm not too exactly sure what. Um, the bottom left is a textiles teacher who used it to film how to make a let me get this right, a fun, non, non-functional button, or a functional button. I'm not sure the difference. <laughs> I was there in the room, but I wasn't paying attention. Um, the bottom one is me. I think that's Courtney Crawford from Queensland, doing all sort of mathsy type stuff. Some people just kind of fill a whiteboard and go from there. But those are sort of the uses. Basically, you can do anything physical with your hands, and it would be pretty good. You're over there. You didn't tell me. <laughs> you're, right, you're right there. <laughs> okay. All right. So then, what's 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 my sign? What am I looking for? I don't know, should we do like a 10-second sign or something? Hold up. Hold up. 10 seconds. 
Because I go like this way. Because I'm the best way. I just feel bad going like this. Should I play music? Yeah. 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 All right, so, yes. I am done. How, how long did I go for? Are we counting that whole conversation you just had? <laughs> well, actually, that's the thing. So, <laughs> if you want to stretch it, introduce yourself for a very long time and kind of say, here's everything about me. You can talk for 10 minutes on this, and then we'll start the time when you start. I actually did that for you. Good. I, I left the about me out of the time. But you still went in about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh, you're in. What's the name of the name programming? Uh, online broadcasting software. Or, or you know, OBS. Everything in that? Everything, yeah. Wow. So if you Google like anyone who records gaming, they, everyone uses this, so it's kind of industry standard. And it's free. Yeah. Free, yeah. yeah. Free, open source, everything. This slideshow is the one we all added our stuff to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I can send this out later. Yeah. As long as you're not <laughs> tweeting. <laughs> Thank you. And I get time myself because I am um, I'm known for rambling. I'm just rambling and rambling. Uh, anyway, I'm Josh. I'm happy to finally talk about something that's not like a, student, a school wide thing that I have to give a PD on. It's something that I'm really passionate about so I can talk about it freely. Um, you might know me as Mystery Lemonades, and yeah, that's part of my life. Um, so I'm going to talk about building relationships with students. Um, it's about me. I'm obviously I'm Canadian, obviously not American. Um, I haven't said A yet, so that's probably why. Uh, I'm at Canterbury, which is just a little bit outside Camberwell. I'm a year six teacher, I'm a 516 leader, I'm also a literacy co leader there. Um, my passions are building these positive two way relationships, uh, really big, gigantic inquiries, and um, really into engaging lessons. I, I get a lot of autonomy from my principal, it basically lets me do whatever I want, which is really great for me. Uh, this is our future project that we did last term where basically everything is about the future, not the curriculum, it doesn't matter. We basically made it work. Uh, we had about three, four hundred people come up. We had cricket-based foods and we had a time machine and we had architecture and we had the future of transport. Um, my school puts on massive, massive, massive inquiries at the end of each term. Um, yes, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Uh, a little bit of my story about building relationships. So I hated school. Shocker. I don't think I don't know if a lot of people did or didn't, but I don't remember anything in primary school. I don't remember learning how to read. I don't remember learning maths. I don't remember really anything except for one teacher. And I do remember just getting to grade nine because that's when we go to high school. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do maths and I can read. It was like a moment of awareness of opening for me. My story is basically in grade four. I had my first male teacher, loved ice hockey, um, came to one of my ice hockey games, never forget it. Only teacher I ever remember. And then it really brought me to the spot that I kind of said, at the end of the day, really, your mid-year report, maths or literacy or whatever it is, won't really have that long-lasting impact, but in the relationship with the student, you'll remember, uh, with the student and teacher. So I think that was the one thing that really prompted me to just shame, uh, you know, shameless plug somewhere over here on the floor as I started writing a book. Um, hopefully at the next, at the end of this year. Um, but going back and going through the biggest thing, I think, was that you get to notice trends. Um, and I think that what I've noticed in Twitter, on Twitter in the last six, seven, eight months is that everyone's talking about relationships now. It's odd to me because it was the one thing I focused on since I started teaching was that the student and you have a great relationship and you know, more want to learn from you and they just have a better time in the classroom. Um, it was never really a thing, that, a shocking moment for me. It was just a normal part of my practice. Um, so I'm really glad that people are talking about it. But I, I sent out a couple of tweets saying, yeah, I'm really glad everyone's talking about this, but like, duh, you know, dot, dot, dot. I can't believe this is not something that we thought of before. So I started looking at well, who and where are all the experts? Who are these relationship experts? Where's the research? We have effect sizes. We have visible learning. We have hits. We have everything all over the place. And there's nothing about relationships. I said, well, where's the research? And I just kind of realized, well, we're, we're the experts. Um, we're in the classroom. We're on, we're on the ground. So I started writing. And I just started writing. I started doing alternative types of research uh, that didn't have effect size on it. And, were part of this, although I will say that I'm a big believer in these and I use these in my practice all the time. However, we're talking about a different thing right now. I started writing some considerations. So what do I consider in my classroom? Kind of like a pre-assessment. <laughs> Just relax and worry, it's okay. Um, what do you actively do in your classroom to build these relationships? What values do you believe in? How do you model these values every day? What do you know about your students and well, what do they know about you? That's that two-way relationship. My kids know about my wife, they know about where I go, they don't have my Facebook, and they don't have my personal Instagram, but they know a lot about me. 
they can start a conversation with me. And by the way, I'm year six teacher, so they're little kids, they're great, you know? Um, how would your students describe you? And is it accurate to how you want to be described? I always do all these end of the year surveys and ask them these questions. How would you describe Mr. B? It's, great. it's a really curious and sometimes uh, not the answer you probably want, but a really great reflection. How do you incorporate student voice and agency in your classroom? So my school, I talked to you about, we literally asked them, what do you want to learn? We made it happen. That's our, that's our job. Do your students exhibit a growth mindset? We talk not so much about that. I can't pack everything in here now, but this is such start stuff that I really value. So I guess types of strategies to get started. I have some research that I've done myself. And the first thing is, <laughs> I'm the guy in the class in the school that just smiles, says hi to everyone, you know, give them high fives, ask everyone how they're eating for lunch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I showed you a video of my walk from my class to the staff room, it's just constant, hi friend, hello, 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 and it's just very constant. And it sounds like a really weird little thing, but I've opened a door to a relationship where I'm removing a stigma of what does this adult want from me. Instead of approaching a student and demanding something or assessment or some sort of uh, answer to a question they might not know, you're just literally saying hi. This uh, interaction anxiety is, is a common thing with kids nowadays. Is they look at you and they're like, and they're like, what does he want? Oh, I'm just saying hi, bye, and see you later. That's it. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> they also don't know my name. Some of them so they just call me Mr. Friend because I'm really walking around going, hi, friend, to everyone. And they call that's the loud guy who just says friend to everyone. I'm not your friend. I'm like, you just hurt my feelings, but it's okay. We'll get through it. Um, but the biggest thing is you, you begin a relationship outside the classroom. So kids come up to me all the time and say, Mr. B, you want to be in your class. I'm like, how do you know that? You're the meanest teacher ever. Like, no, it's not true. All because I just say hi to them. Like, very, very simple thing. Uh, I decided to hunt down like different types of research. So I found this TEDx uh, from Ron Gutman, I think uh, his name is The Power Smile. And he says, um, from his research, that it's almost impossible to frown when someone's smiling at you. And I do it with my kids all the time. They're like, yeah, right, Mr. B, and I just look at them and go, and then they eventually just start laughing. It's funny. Um, about one third of us smile more than 20 times a day, and approximately 14% of us smile less than five times a day, which is stark comparison to kids who smile up to 400 times a day. Imagine the identification that they're trying to meet with you if you don't smile. That's the one thing they do a lot of. What are they going to think? That's the mean teacher. We don't want him or her. Um, so this, this, uh, TEDx is just great for facial expression. You realize it's the most easily and commonly known facial expression that we can recognize. The same with kids. They know when you're sad, they're happy, you're having a good day, you're having a bad day. So, um, the research I basically started going was leaning down the side, and I have lots of it obviously, but I only have mm, one minute to tell you about it. So, another simple strategy that you could probably start doing, and I really implore you to really go out there and just literally say hi to them and walk away. You open it more. Interaction anxiety. Never skip an opportunity to build trust with some other kid. If you, you notice when they're down. You notice when something's wrong. Take the time. To me, what's one recess speaking to a child to solve a problem that they're obviously having over a course of a relationship over years? To me, it's, it's minuscule. It's so little that I have to give up 15 minutes to talk to a kid just to solve something and build that trust, especially kids in my class during this year. The second I see an opportunity to do it, I'm jumping on it. I want to help them. I want them to show my value. I want them to see that I am going to help you. All right? Last thing, find something unique. Now, I told you I say hello friend a lot. And I have this sort of hello friend. I have a friend. I have a child who is in year four and I'm in year six. Knowing that he might be in my class one day, he has some behavior issues. I want to get to know him really before any of that might happen. I kept saying hello friend every day. Hello friend. Bump it. Cool. He, for the longest time, thought I was saying hello friend. So he didn't realize why I was calling him Fred. His name's Declan. So he, said, he started coming up to me and going, and going um, I'm Declan. I'm like, yeah, I, re I realize that. Like, I know you. His sister's in my class. And I go, did you think I was calling you Fred? He goes, yeah. And I go, just a funny story we had. So every day since that day, we walk down and I say, hello, Fred. He says, hello, Fred. And then other teachers who don't really know that we have this relationship go, you know his name's Declan, right? I'm like, it's all good. Um, but just a funny thing that we have that's very unique goes a really long way. I love to hear your stories, and I'm just 30 seconds over. I love to hear your stories. If you have one, I would love to read them. Hashtag HelloFriend. 
have a tweet at me. I'd love to hear about them. Um, if you want any more information about this, I've done a lot of research on it. Just get back to smiling, saying hello, getting in that interaction anxiety. Please come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about it as well. Otherwise, looking forward to hearing from the rest of you. Thanks. Okay, uh, my name is Bernadette Chia, and I wanted to tell you a little about Teach Me, because um, could you just put your hand over if this is the first Teach Me that you've ever been to? Yeah, I had a feeling about that. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've been in Teach Me since, um, on and off, since 2011. So I wanted to tell you a bit of the story of Teach Me. Um, so Teach Me first began uh, right over in Edinburgh in 2006, and it was held in a pub. And a guy called Ewan McIntosh, he's been out to Australia once or twice, I've briefly met him. Um, he's the one who set it up. It was called Scott Egg Logs, but that was a bit sort of nationally focused, so he changed it then to Teach Me. So it, it began in Australia in 2011, I think probably New South Wales, they've started. Um, but it wasn't long, a lady called Celia Coffer, who I think some of you might know Celia, she's now over in Adelaide, I think. But Celia was the one who started it, and I went to some of Ilya, I think yeah, we went to some. Yeah, we went to some of the very earliest ones, and we used to go to people's schools, like just like what we're doing tonight. Except we tended to go on a Saturday afternoon or a Thursday afternoon for some reason. Um, but we also we had people who belonged to different places. So we also went. I remember going to the Immigration Museum, and that was fantastic. So you have a little quick tour around the Immigration Museum and then you'd have your teaching and it was fantastic going to the Children's Hospital as well, someone worked there as an educator, so we got to visit a few places. So I found this on Google image <laughs> that what's a teach meet, it's, um, it's informal but it's relevant and you'll, get, you'll gather that from what we've already heard. It's fun, it's, it's light hearted, people gather in a room, um, we volunteer to present. And I ended up doing my PhD incorporating some aspects of, te of Teach Me into it. The beauty of it is it's a grounds up movement and it doesn't matter if you're, just, if you're a pre-service teacher or we've only been teaching a year, you get up here along with people who've been teaching 40 years and, and whatever. It's very equalising and you go home with great ideas and often you connect with people on Twitter and other forms as well. Some people call it Gorilla PD as opposed to the formal stuff schools offer. It's social, there's no pressure. Presentations are short and sweet. Um, I think it used to be seven minutes actually, rather than eight was the the amount. There'd usually be a break halfway through and who the school that was organising it would put on, you know, afternoon tea. And that was very important for networking and anyone could present. You, you signed up on a wiki space back in those days. And I mean, Wiki's not quite, probably quite as um, popular at these days. And oh, it's gone. It's it gone. It's, it's gone. gone. Yeah. Wiki's yeah. gone, yeah. 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 But back yeah. in those days, Wiki was good. Yeah. Um, and it was beautiful in the sense you could see, oh, there's not many people presenting, I probably should present. So that, that was the advantage of it. You could see cumulatively how people signed up, and you signed up if you were coming as well. Now, I did when I did some of my research, um, some of you might follow on Twitter, Matt Esterman, he's up in New South Wales, and he and Cameron Patterson, yeah. Um, so they say the raw effective power is teach me its real impact on the people who are involved in this. Um, organic professional learning, I like some of those phrases. Um, this was from a blog, love to teach me. I go to conferences, seminars, lectures, I listen to podcasts, do professional reading, I sit in and meeting. I listen to discussion panels, but where I really get the chance to test ideas, converse and compare is teach me. So I thought that was very interesting. And then this is Aitzel. They even like teach me. Um, participants drive the sessions, which are highly informal, uh, supported by online presence. So I thought it's, that's back in 2014. Even from then, they were starting to support it as part of professional learning. So in my research, I spoke to people uh, right throughout Australia through Skype. We did Skype interviews, and this was someone in Western Australia where Teach Me is quite big in Perth and around those parts of Western Australia. And this lady described herself, this is in her but as a magpie teacher, always going to Teach Me to pick up an idea, take it back to her school. Um, I, 
I didn't intend to initially, but I ended up with some New, a New Zealand participant from Auckland, and he he done he really got a long way with uh, with Teach Meets. His his whole career had progressed because of what he'd been involved in with with Teach Meets. Um, relevant professional learning. Uh, you take the ideas. Um, you can read some of that. Some um, Teach Meets are very subject specific. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's a history one that you might go to for one week. Um, but what some people like, and these are casual teachers often, because I was, my research focused mainly on early career teachers, and a lot of them were casual teachers who didn't get any PD in their own schools. And I've been doing as an old person doing the CRT, and I know that they feel like you're on the periphery of a school. You don't get invited to the PD, but this was PD they could come to and contribute to and, and count as part of their hours as well. Uh, then some of these young first year teachers, they went to a teach meet and went back to their school, picked up an idea, went back to their school and um, they were the heroes. Where did these guys get these ideas from? They're only first year out teachers, you know, like it was um, very empowering for them. Just how am I going for time? Two minutes. Two minutes, right. yeah. Um, so, I don't know whether you've heard of Wenger, but he talks of a landscape of practice, and I thought of Teach Meet as part of a landscape of practice, uh, where you don't, you, school, you have your school, but you have other things beyond your school where you learn. And the people then, like those young teachers in Perth, who went to one community and took the ideas back to another community, that's what Wenger would call a broker, taking uh, the learning from one place to another, and in terms of self-efficacy, professional identity, social connection, they were all really strong features that emerged out of being a broker. Teach Meets also worldwide. I've got a friend, uh, Nags Ammond, I don't know whether you follow her, she's up in Ireland, Belfast, I think she is. She's doing a whole PhD on Teach Me. So <laughs> we keep in touch a bit. Hong Kong, Cambridge, America, Glasgow, networks. Um, library teachers get together, science teachers, all different ones. Now, um, that is a little video from Matt for two minutes, 20 minutes, not two minutes, 20 seconds or something, but I don't know whether it'll work on this, maybe not, it might. Matt's up in New South Wales, teach me. He will like to know that he's here then in spirit. He's not on the teacher and see as well. There are three reasons to really. One, he may ask. Well, it is that he takes straight into the classroom the next day. <laughs> Two, you can meet some great people who follow who follow part of your professional learning network. And three, you get a little bit of inspiration. So it sort of just pushes you towards the end of the term. So there are three really good reasons why you should join a teach me, why you should present it at a teach me, Sunday maybe what you should host on. So that's Matt, and that's the end of me as well. Okay. Um, hi, my name's um, Rebecca Beck, please. The only person who calls me Rebecca is my mum, and when I'm in trouble. Um, I met uh, Stephen at ResCon last year because I flipped my Year 12 biology classroom, and what I'm going to talk to you about today sort of came out about from flipping my classroom, and retrieval practice is my current little thing that I'm on about. Um, I'm the Head of Science, um, 10 to 12 at Caulfield Grammar. I teach VC of Biology and Science. And I'm going to talk to you today about structure strips. OK. Um, so I flipped my classroom. I decided to go whole hog, Year 12 Biology, and flip every lesson. And so students watch screencasts at home. They take notes. However, I have to check, have they watched it? Have they understood it? And so first um, incantation was just a brain dump. They came in, they had a couple of minutes just to write down what they could remember. Um, now I know that that's a brain dump and that's retrieval practice and so that was legitimate. However, I wanted to find out a way in which did they have what I needed in their notes. And so I went on Twitter and I came across this thing called structure strips. And they're initially used to break down like a, a six mark or a 10 mark question, and so that you break down the stages for a student to answer the question or for an essay. And so I thought, oh, I can use this, and I can ask specific questions about 
the screencast so that I know that they have definitely got the key ideas of that screencast in their notes. They're only allowed to use their notes um, to answer these questions. So they come in and they are super well trained. They come in, they grab their structure strip book. First 10 minutes of the class is answering the questions and they go through and they answer the questions. I then collect them up. We then have a concept review. We then do activities and that's how my class um, goes for 55 minutes. Um, then at the end, I then go through the structure strip books. I know what I'm looking for, so it's very quick to mark, but I can see what students have understood, what they've misunderstood, any misconceptions, and then that afternoon I put together a blog post based on what they weren't able to do in the structure strip questions that came up in class. Um, and so that was the initial reason that I did it. And then at the end of last year when I did it for the first time, my year 12s went, oh my God, we've got a summary of the entire course in one book, done and dusted. I went, oh, I hadn't figured that. That was not my intention. So um, I know it's successful because when students miss a class, they ask, can they take their structure strip book home to complete the structure strip that they missed? Um, so it checks their notes to ensure that key ideas included. I use it for formative assessment. Um, summary of the entire course. As you can see up here, they also have to rate what they feel that their level of understanding is coming into the class. So there's a metacognitive aspect to it. Other uses that you could do is to break down an essay. You could break down a paragraph. You could break down your six mark, your 10 mark questions um, that enable the students to see what the steps are involved in order for them to be able to complete a question. And that's my thing. Thank you. Um, thanks. I just wanted to also say thank you to Stephen. Very excited to meet him for the first time and other people that I haven't met. And um, Twitter has given me so much. So I'm really happy to be here and see all these people now in real life. Um, so I hope I'm going for five minutes. I'll see. I haven't actually timed it. Sorry. Um, Ilya is my name. Uh, Dutch Australian. Uh, I work at Wesley College. I'm the teacher development coordinator and it's an MYP DP school. Um, I'm really interested in professional development and teacher learning, things like that. So I love Teach Meets. Um, I have been going for a while and I'm just really happy that they're being organised again. Because, Bernice, would you say that there's been a bit of a lull for yeah, a while? Yeah, kind of there was a bit of a dip? A bit of a, a dip. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we can all just, you know, yeah. get back into it. Yeah. Great. Um, so, my topic is uh, the art of digital annotation, and it's basically just um, another way of getting creative with apps and things like that. Um, but I, I use it in class and I use it for myself. So, um, I'm very much a scrib scribbler. Um, I love it most when I can write in books. That's, I just love sort of, um, I find it really hard to read anything without a pen. If I read, I want to write something. Um, I have some books that I've written all over, but I can't write in every book, unfortunately. So that's why I ha use a lot of different apps for the books that I can't write in to sort of make annotations and things like that. Um, and I do this for my students as well. Um, so highlighting, I tell my students always, is one of the least effective ways to study. Um, and I believe if you annotate, it's, it's a more involved and more active process, so hopefully the students will remember more. So I ask them to, when I give them a photocopy of anything, I usually photocopy it so there's lots of white margin around it, and I, and I force them to annotate. But again, that's when you have pen and paper. If you don't have pen and paper, here are some things that I'd like to share with you that I use. So getting creative with text, and it's a real fashion now at the moment. Everybody's into retrieval practice. <laughs> yes, so am I. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. It's the theme of this teach meet, I think. Um, but yeah, I believe that you know you follow that then up with other forms of effective study methods. Um, so these are the few things that I'll be presenting to you. Let's start with book snaps. Is the first one. As far as I know. That lady, she's in America, I think she's the one that sort of has made it big. Um, but a book snap is basically just a photo of a piece of text. So if you can't write in the book or you don't have a photocopy, um, you take a photo of a piece of text and then you up, you mark up that, that photo with um, different ways, uh, different apps, sorry. 
So um, always add a summary, and it can be really you can really go over the top. It's almost like a form of digital scrapbooking. It's it's however far you want to take it. Um, it works best for small bits of text. Uh, it can be a bit fid fiddly, and you have to use apps. But this does work with your students as well, and I have my students do it. Here's some examples. I've used different peoples. Um, there's one I made. So basically, photo, and then you do things with that photo. These are the apps that I use. I, I, Snapchat as an app, I don't use, but I use it to annotate. It is the best for annotating. So um, when the kids go, oh my god, are you using Snapchat? I'm like, yes, but it's only for <laughs> this. I don't, I don't even know what my account name is, but the functionality of Snapchat for annotating photos is really quite awesome. Um, so do try, seriously, you can do so many fun things with Snapchat. Um, so have a video, um, Stephen, you're going to make this um, available to everybody. There's a video, it, and also you just play around with it. Um, so it's the easiest way, start off simple, because basically you take a photo of what you're reading, and then in Snapchat, you just circle the bit that you like the best, um, and that's your Snapchat. But then if you want to take it a step further, you can add bitmojis, you can add whatever, you know, you can go nuts. Um, bitmojis depends on you, if what type of person you are, but it's fun to set up. And you can use these bit, this is supposed to be me, I don't know, if, it never looks like you anyway. <laughs> this is supposed to be me, and then sometimes if students hand in work um, on the computer, I will give them, particularly year seven, but you know what, year 12 still loves it as well. So it's, it's a digital sticker. Um, try it, it's good fun. This one is the other app, so book snap, um, sorry, Snapchat is the first one. Pick Collage, you can download that as well, is I think the best one. Um, gives you the most functionality and you can be most creative with. When you get the PowerPoint, um, have a look at these two. So I'm so ba bad, I don't know if it's bad, I'm so over the top that when I read, I basically share the whole book in book snaps. And you've seen them, Stephen. Sometimes they're a bit like, whoa, Ilya, yeah, it's a bit, what else do you do? But yeah, uh, <laughs> um, have a look. Um, but it's basically for myself as well, because then I can go back and I can see all the key points from uh, Willingham and William, and it's, it's for myself, it's for my own learning. Here's some examples of the things I made for, um, for those two books and other books that I've read. It's just like summarizing for myself. So this is still a form of annotating, but because I, I take photos, I copy, and I put little things around it. Um, okay, so that was Pick Collage and Snapchat. I didn't do Skitch, I think, I forgot, but anyway, that's another one. You can have a look at it. This is another thing, so this is not book snaps, but this is annotating um, using Kami, um, and it's a slightly different functionality. So Kami is a tool that you can use on PC, but also as an app. And those in edgy reading may already be familiar with it. Um, it's basically collaborative annotating. And this works really well in the classroom as well, so I use it with my students. If we have a big text that we have to read, everybody reads that text on Kami, and they can highlight and put comments in that text. So it actually becomes a really rich resource where everybody sort of has to contribute something. And at the start, I mandated that the students had to leave a comment, but now the students are used to it and they leave more comments by themselves. So, there's so many different things that you can do. You can respond to each other. You can uh, see who's online. It's really quite a nice interactive way to deal with a text. Um, how you use it, if you use Google, um, Google Drive, it's really easy. You just install it as an add-on and then um, you just open it in Kami. That's the easiest. If you don't use Google Drive, you can just go to Kami app and um, just upload your document and then it will give you a link and you can share that with students. And all you do is share and if you leave it open, anybody on the internet can, can access it and, and add comments. So it's very collaborative. And then finally, this is using Google Docs. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this because I just felt that 
you would know, most of you hopefully um, have used it in the, um, or are going to use it. Um, so it's also, you can make the same sort of comments, but I find actually Kami better. It has more functionality than Google Docs. But if you are a Google Doc user, it's a really good way of um, just adding comments and the students can respond to it. So then you get lots of people on the same document, similar to Kami, but I, I prefer Kami because it's got more bells and whistles. And that's it. Okay, um, so my name is Cassandra. Um, Cass, everyone calls me Cass. Um, I work at AMC, with, we're at Melbourne University, the Australian Mathematics Science Institute, yay. Um, we met with some of you, you might have seen secondary teachers, you might have seen our Choose Maths project and we sent posters out to all the schools across Australia. The new posters are currently in the mail. Um, if you can't get posters or you want them, just email me and I will send you as many posters as you want. I'll just, when I, just, I just wait till the office lady goes to, to, goes to lunch. Right. Um, so the Anti Schools project was um, basically we were funded by um, BHP. <coughs> And um, uh, we work in 120 schools across Australia, secondary and primary, but I'm a primary school teacher, so I only work in primary schools. Um, I work in schools in the west of Melbourne and the schools in the Hunter Valley. Hunter Valley has much nicer wine. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so basically um, when you're travelling on the road a lot, you get to listen to a lot of podcasts. So I can recommend Craig Barton's podcast, um, Mr Barton's Maths. Um, so I was listening to that. And um, there's some really good ones from Dylan Williams and stuff, if you're, even if you're not, not a maths person. Um, and this one, uh, Elizabeth and Robert Bjork, and they talk about desirable difficulties. So um, it's a really good podcast. Um, so that got me um, stuck. So after I listened to the podcast, Craig has this, um, he has a website where it has like, for more information, you go and read it. So I got these, um, these two books here. Um, so make it stick. And powerful teaching. So um, I can recommend both these books. Um, make it stick. Um, I guess the thing is about working in lots of different schools across the country, even my colleagues. Um, basically, we, when we come back to Back to Base Week, we're talking about the same different schools, same problems. And why isn't why isn't the learning sticking? What's not working? Why are we why do we keep rolling out these PDs on how to teach decimals, how to teach fractions for the five years of the project? Um, and so, anyway, I just thought that these two books have some really good ideas. It talks about learning versus performance, um, this idea about retrieval practice, interleaving spacing. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Then this book is sort of the follow-up to this one. Um, yep, but, uh, both of the authors are on Twitter. Um, I followed both of them and they followed me back straight away. And Patrice has started sending me messages, which is nice. Um, um, I've also left in some, um, if you haven't got time to read the books, um, there's a podcast on the book from Cult of Pedag Pedagogy. Um, there's also a website that just has some stuff about retrieval practice. Um, this person, um, uh, oops, oh, the light's not working. Um, Debbie, she's just done a really good um, blog post where she's basically read the book for you and she's done a really good summary. <laughs> uh, if you don't have time. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, yep. Yeah. And um, if you like the Juice Maths project, that's fantastic, but it is finishing at the end of the year, so um, we're all hurtling towards unemployment. Um, so if you want any primary schools or secondary teachers, we have a whole team of us, eight of us. And yeah. But, um, thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to um, talk about number talks, but um, I also like to do Office 365 stuff, but my current role, probably not as much doing that as, that, as, as, as I have previously done. But when I, um, a couple of years ago, I came across this book by Kathy Humphries and Ruth Park about making number talks matter. And it's just about a way of really getting um, students more numerate in their, in their thinking. Because the idea of, the idea of it is to actually get them to think about how they think about their maths and how they solve their problems and get them to realise that there's only, there's not just one way of doing it. And this is an explanation. So if I ask you guys, how would you count how many um, dots there are? What would you say? So some people are going across, some people are going that way, and then count the one down the middle. I saw the dice pattern five, and then it's got two on the yep. edges. Exactly. So even then, there's about three or four different ways you can actually, and it's one good one to show teachers to start off because that's where you get to get to thinking the idea of it. 
And that's why I like, I thought I'd show it now. Now, from that, a guy on Twitter, not Twitter, um, Facebook has done his own thing, he's from the US, he can actually buy these. But what I like about them is this bit here. You introduce show the problem, allow students to think about it, you ask students for solutions only. So you, you ask and say, who's got a solution? And they'll say the answer is 50, or whatever it happens to be. And you might write those up, and then you might ask what those solutions were. So he's actually got this nice process you can follow if you're a bit unsure. What he's done here is he's given some examples of what you could use. And you know, if you want to use that one, here's some ways that you can actually, how it can be done. It's not the only ways it can be done, um, but it's just a way of doing that. This is fully into American standards, not ours. But you know, you can come with your own ones. It doesn't have to be nice problems. He's got ones that got addition, modified and subtraction. It could be just a, a simple problem solving task that they have to think about. The idea is they're doing it in their head, they're not actually writing the answers down. And if somebody says, oh, I've got an answer, okay, think of another way of doing it. So it's getting them to think about the different ways that they can actually think about their mass rather than just here's an algorithm, here's your algorithm. In a way, you get them to think of their own algorithm approach that they can do. And this is just a quicker, more close up, so you can actually see it in a bit more detail. Um, and that's basically the idea. So, as an example, here's a standard algorithm, but you can decompose it, you can make adjustment, do all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's the basic idea of number talks. Uh, I think we've got eight minutes. So, uh, I'm just recently retired from Monash University after 17 years there as a teacher educator. Before that, I was a primary, a, a P to 12 uh, principal, and before that, a secondary school teacher. So, I've spent the last, since 1982, in education. It's a long time. Uh, and I haven't lived. Um, I'm a second language English learner, although I was born in this country. So, uh, child of migrants, refugees, both people. Uh, I wanted to, today to unpack the mythology around private schools and public schools. So, we might know who, who that Bette Noir is. Hands up, correct, France? Francis? Kevin Donnelly? Uh, but this one we don't, you may not know, but she was standing in my local electorate, Kate, Kate Ashmore, uh, in the federal election in uh, what was um, Port Phillip and now it's uh, McNamara, City of McNamara. So, Kevin tells us from his research that Catholic and independent schools save states, territories, and Commonwealth governments billions of dollars each year. He also says that a student's socioeconomic status is not the most significant factor influencing educational outcomes. He's also on the record as having said private schools achieve stronger results compared to most government schools, even when taking into account differences in ability levels and socioeconomic status of students. Given that I've debated this guy both uh, in person, online, uh, in print, in the media, I thought, I need to actually do the research to find out if this is true, if this is true. Because it's an accepted, it's accepted wisdom that private schools outperform public schools. And I know we've got some private school people here, and I'm, I think you're from Wesley? My kids go to Wesley, but I teach corporate. Yeah. Yes, so uh, I'm going to actually talk about Wesley in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking candidate for the Liberal Party. I don't know why they ever chose her because she was never going to win with, with a mouth and a brain and hers. But this is what she said: Private schools and teachers are far superior. She said this online, in, sorry, in print in the Age. And she said the facilities, teaching staff, and pastoral care offered by private schools make them far superior to the vast majority of government schools. This is kind of the things that people read and hear about all the time. So I want to unpack this. So. I've collected a whole lot of data and been doing this since 2014, so it's a longitudinal study. My data comes from ACARA, from BCAA, my school, and the school websites that uh, you can trawl through when you've got a research assistant who will pay for and pay for <laughs> So the data comes from 508 Victorian schools, and I'm doing a similar study now with the 
Public Education Foundation in New South Wales, looking at their schools. Uh, I excluded select entry uh, public schools. There are four of them. I excluded them because I know that they outperform every other school as they should. They're cherry picked. Um, so I didn't want anybody to say, oh, you're cooking the books, you know. But, uh, last year, the student resource standard was 13,764 for secondary students across Australia. Uh, more than half of Victorian public schools currently receive less than that SRS. More than half. Uh, most private schools are way above that SRS. So I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to show you that uh, public schools actually outperform or equal private schools. And I'm going to show you that they do it with far less money. Uh, of the 70 highest Ixia, that's the Index of Cultural, Socio and Economic Advantage. Uh, 1,000 is the average across all of Australia. It's just a, a nominal benchmark. If you're above that, you're advantaged. If you're below that, you're disadvantaged. That's the way it works. Uh, you get more disadvantaged points if you've got Indigenous students, uh, EAL students, uh, regional, rural, remote, disability, all those kinds of things, they all sort of top up your reach, your disability allowance, and you get more money because of that. So schools are really interested in having these kinds of students in their school, or not, as, as the case might be. Of the 70 highest Ixia schools in Victoria, only one, there's only one public school. So when I ranked 508 schools on an Excel spreadsheet, after my research assistant, I don't know what hard work I work, <laughs> let's press the button. Uh, there was only one public school in the first 70, and that was pretty good. Okay. More than half of Victorian public schools, as I said before, receive less than the SRS. But I want to, want to show you today that from this research, public schools have similar or even better VCE results than private schools with similar rankings of socioeconomic status. Firstly, uh, let's look at the, some of the most expensive schools in our state of Victoria. And, uh, so that's on the, uh, horizontal, on the vertical uh, index access is their fee that they charge for year 12, not the average that's fee. No, I know. <laughs> this is this is, I think this is probably a year or so old. Okay? And this is not without additional fees. Alright? Uh, so this is actually 2017, my 2017 chart. I couldn't look before bothered doing it again. No, no, just, yeah. But that's okay. So, I think it's got, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it goes up at least 5% for Adam every, every year, yeah. without fail. And of course we know our wages are, are stagnating or going backwards for most people. Um, however, what was interesting when I, when I looked at their, at their results for VCE, and some people have challenged me and said, well, you're only looking at VCE, not at IB. And the best students do IB. I don't think that should make any difference to their results. So Wesley, and that's uh, Wesley in um, uh, Springvale. Oh, no, Glenway. Glenway, sorry. They came 130th in the state out of 508 schools. That, when I was talking about VCE results here, we were talking at uh, percentage of students over 40 and uh, their median VCE score. Um, John Grammar, 124, and so you can see working our way down. Um, so even with the most expensive schools, they, you can't buy a good education that's going to have you confirmed uh, as getting top VC results. So I prepared, and you can have, you can go to this website here. Uh, where my articles, the research was published in April on the conversation. If you don't read the conversation, uh, you're missing out on a whole lot of good research. Free to subscribe. It's an online daily uh, newspaper that comes out. It's written by academics for the general public. It's called The Conversation because you can have a go at academics. Um, I've extracted just some. I haven't cherry picked up uh, results, but you can see here Princess Hill High School. Uh, it's got about the same X year as Wesley College, and that's Wesley College um, in, uh, in uh, Wheelers Hill, I think. Yeah. Glen Waverley, yeah. 
So median study score 32, similar study score 32. Percentage of students over 40%, 138 .8, compared to 8.7. And you can read down there. And I stuck in Brunswick, because we're at Brunswick, um, secondary college, and you can see that their year is just over the national average. So they're not really advantaged or disadvantaged, but when you compare their results with uh, Emmaus College, which charges um, $6,900 for fees in, for year 12, because when you go to the My School website uh, and look at parent contribution, it's the average across the whole, the whole cohort. But I, well, not me, my research assistant, <laughs> uh, went to every website and found out what people are paying in year 12, because it can be $6,000 more than year 7 or more. So we can see here that they get total government funding of $10,000 at state and, and uh, and federal funding, and Brunswick gets $12,000. So the $2,000 difference in government funding, but of course it's $4,000 difference in total funding for student. And so the results, and, and this is just a, a small section of uh, the results, the further down you go, and there, there's only 13 schools, private schools in Victoria that are below 1000 next year. 13. I'll come to that in a minute. I want to point out Mary Warren South Secondary College. It's a big 12 school. It's got over almost 2,000 students there. That's become a school of choice now for that area because their next year is 948. But I think they have 48 different language groups in that school. We're now there to visit. Uh, the immediate study score was 32. That's across all VC subjects. So it was 36 in physics. 31 in English. Incredible results. 10%, uh, almost 11% of their kids last year got VC study scores over 40%. It's an amazing, amazing result. With very little government funding. Very little government funding. And of course, year 12 fees is $258. And they're not actually fees because they're a parent contribution. You can't force parents to pay if they can't pay. This is uh, a chart of um, Ixia uh, from 2017, yep, just finishing up, Ixia 2017, uh, state uh, public versus private. Uh, the average funding, you can see it's far less, and the average result across all schools, the blue is public, the orange is private, 27.5 compared to 29. Hardly any difference, hardly any difference. So my conclusion is that spending more money on students actually doesn't actually guarantee you a better result. Um, the equestrian facilities, rowing sheds, etc., they make life much more genteel. Uh, I like to use the analogy, uh, I'm an aeroplane, I'm going long haul to London, uh, I'm in uh, cattle club, economy class, and there are people in business, and there are some who are paying $10,000 in first class with their own some air of the air, etc. We all get there at the same time, just with a different modicum of comfort. Uh, the only factors I think that can make a are making a difference are the teachers and the students. Public schools defy expectations and labels, and the best performing education systems are those that combine equity with quality, they give all children opportunities for quality education. And finally, how much better would public schools be performing with the $24 billion per annum that's given from federal and state funds went to the public schools that needed them? Thank you. Sorry for my over time. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm Ollie. I love it. Uh, you can ask me about podcasting, the science of learning. So I've been really interested in things like the authors are with figures and things like that as well. Um, reading and research or anything, I run a bit of a blog, do some blogging, do a weekly email and things like that. And I also run a podcast called the Education Research Reading Room. Has anyone heard of the podcast? Yes. Oh, really? Cool. <laughs> That's 20 bucks, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, speaking today, speaking today about 
the Dylan William Embedding Performative Assessment PD Pack. So a bit of a context for how the senior maths team at my school came to start working with this PD Pack. So previously, the work uh, I've been doing with the senior maths team has been a lot about uh, things like cognitive load theory or, and science of learning, retrieval and spacing effects, which we've heard about today. Uh, but I was really keen, I guess I can say, I felt like we all had a solid understanding of this science of learning ideas now, but I was really keen to start doing something where we could try things out in the classroom more actively and also have uh, more of an effective dialogue around that. I was particularly interested in formative assessment because, I don't know, I've been curious for people's thoughts on this, um, but I was thinking the other day, if you only had, say, an hour to teach someone how to teach, and, you know, Steve does a similar thing when he goes over to Cambodia and only has a few days with teachers to work with them, what could you teach someone in that hour that would give them the tools to actually do a decent job, right? And I was thinking, if you actually gave them a really solid understanding of what formative assessment is, the idea of monitoring what your students are learning and then adapting your practice accordingly, you're essentially giving people a principle um, from which they can use kind of the first principles of approach to derive instructional strategies that are effective. So I was really excited about formative assessment for that reason. Um, which I guess we could say explains the, the mechanism of formative assessment. Um, and then also, I, I thought there was really a demonstrated impact of the efficacy of formative assessment, and I had Dylan William on the podcast. He talked in particular about a large randomised controlled trial in the UK run by the EEF um, using his PD pack, and it was really positive. Um, I was speaking for eight minutes, so I had a little bit of time to go into the principles behind the program. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of five principles, which I've grouped under three headings here today, of the program, which are choice and fle flexibility, small steps, and accountability and support. And I think these are interesting because they, they're not just tied to this Dylan William EFA pack, they're actually principles that can underlie any professional development, and I'm hopefully that's relevant for people here who are working in that space. So the first one is choice and flexibility. So I guess the first question here is, has anyone within a school ever been asked to do something that they didn't want to do? <laughs> kind of a redundant question, isn't it? In a room full of teachers. Yeah, so the great thing about being asked to do something um, that you don't want to do is you can try it half heartedly, and at the end you can say, I tried what you told me to do, and it didn't work. Right? So that's the great thing about that. So the idea about embedding choice and flexibility into your PD approach is that it actually helps us to move from, I tried that and it didn't work, to hopefully helps teachers be more motivated to be able to say, I tried it, didn't work, but I'm really curious to find out why it didn't work. Okay? So that's the choice of flexibility. I actually went to the teachers in the team and asked them for a few comments about how the program is going for them. So here, here are some comments in relation to that and in relation to choice of flexibility. Um, usually I would just let you read this due to the redundancy effect, but we've got some podcast people listening, so I'll read the quotes. Uh, I, like, I like that there is a <laughs> I like that there is a choice because not all strategies work equally well in all subjects, so we pick what fits. Skip one, it's good because we're not being told you do this or you do that, there's a choice. And finally, it doesn't matter that you're doing different things because there's actually a richness in that diversity. For example, another teacher tried a different strategy to me, I thought mine wasn't as good so I adapted theirs or adopted theirs. So things like that. So some of the teachers who have been involved have really been enjoying that choice and flexibility. Small steps. I won't say much on this, but it's just based upon the idea of uh, learning fast and changing slow, slash the idea that building habits takes time. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the idea that going to one-off PD or having a one-off PD uh, is unlikely to have a lasting impact on you, unless of course it's a teach me. <laughs> um, and the final idea is supportive accountability is the idea of kind of uh, action triggers, implementation intentions, and things like that. So this is utilising a framework that Dylan provides, which is the personal action plan, which is something that we all do at the end of each of our sessions, and I'll go into a bit more detail about the sessions in a minute. And we just fill this out, basically. Uh, we plan the technique we're going to use, uh, explain why, the why behind what we're going to use it. We plan explicitly the class in which we're going to use it and the date that we're going to use it. Uh, in, in addition to that, we also plan the person who's going to observe us, and that might just be for the 10 minutes of the lesson in which we're actually using that strategy. Make some notes about what, you're going to, what you need to do to prepare, and crucially, attention is all about trade-offs. Uh, plan what you're going to do less of. 
teacher comments about supportive accountability. The discussion that we have afterward is one of the most useful and supportive things to help us to reflect and improve upon our implementation. We have the chance to listen about the techniques that other teachers have applied, so we get to ask, them, ask the other teachers what worked and what didn't work. And finally, has created a nice culture of collaboration, especially for me, where I wouldn't usually be interacting with some of the other teachers in the group. So how does it work? Just briefly, the actual format of the approach. The end of each session, so we meet about once per month, uh, for 75 minutes. Uh, Dylan says that if you meet for any less than 75 minutes, that constitutes a lethal mutation of the program. And we've actually found that. Um, you really do need at least 75 minutes. Up to two hours is really great as well. The end part of the session is with that personal action planning, as we talked about before. The middle of the session is some new resource. So it could be, they're, well, they're all from Dylan William, but it's just formative assessment techniques, essentially. A little kind of taste or inspiration. And the start of the next session is spent debriefing upon that. Um, this is my second to last slide. And so talking about to improve, things I'm keen to improve in terms of uh, implementing it. If you're keen to try out some thoughts and the next steps. So to improve, I'm really keen to work out how to debrief more effectively. I've been finding it difficult to work out the balance between giving everyone a chance to talk. Our group's got six or seven people within it. And so it takes time to get around, but also you want to go into depth. And I feel that when someone shares something they've tried in their classroom and they want to troubleshoot it, you could actually talk for half an hour just about that one thing and drilling, drilling in. So I haven't quite worked that balance out yet. And also I've been finding that the Dylan Learn curriculum is a little bit crowded. Um, I guess this is just our, our, our experience so far, and it might not be the experience of everyone. But we've been finding that and because a new strategy or technique is introduced each month, you often want to modify what you did the previous month and improve upon that. And so we've actually just started to do that from time to time and mix it up a little bit ourselves. 15 seconds less left. Um, if you're keen to try it, I would say that um, it's the process more than the content. So you could actually use any content in order to do this. It's just the process of planning ahead, doing the explicit planning, coming back debriefing and having a little uh, motivation there. Um, and, uh, and extending from this, I'm really keen to work out how to, well first of all, I've been finding it's really valuable just the way it's been changed in the dialogue and we've had some of the most rich discussions we've had, we've had in our PD sessions that we've had to date. And I've been thinking more about, could we utilise this in the actual classroom with students? Getting students to talk about their learning in the same way that we're talking about a professional development. So to say, I'm going to try this new strategy, um, preparing for the next SAP, and then getting them to debrief and have a discussion about whether it works. So that's just something that's on my mind in terms of extending this idea. Uh, and a slide to go us down, this is just the contents of the PD pack, um, so you can have a think about that. Uh, hi, I'm Chris, I'm from Cool Australia. Uh, we're an education not for profit, and essentially we're a group of teachers that make um, free lesson plans for teachers. So if you haven't used us before, uh, there is our website over there. Uh, what we do is we partner up with people who have expertise. So we'll partner up with scientists, with documentary makers, and essentially we stop them from making teacher resources themselves because we know that usually that's a bad move. And um, we say to them, hey, as a group of teachers, we've networked out to teachers who can write it for us. We'll make those resources for you. So essentially we take all their knowledge, we take all their skills, we take all their documentary footage, and we turn them into resources that teachers can use. So all you need to do is jump onto our site, create a free account, and start downloading away. Uh, we've got stuff um, from early learning all the way up to year 10. We don't tackle year 11 and 12 at the moment because we go Australia-wide and that's really hard. Um, but we've got cool stuff up on there, um, lots of documentary films. If you guys have seen 2040, um, Damon who did that sugar film, we've got all his official stuff. We're about to tackle, um, tackle. Um, uh, the final quarter, the Adam Goods doco, so if you've seen that recently, we'll have some stuff up there in September. We cover all curriculum areas, um, all of those year levels, jump in, download free. The cool thing about it is that we know that each of your classrooms is different, so you can download our stuff as Word documents, amend, adapt, change them up, give us some feedback, we'll change them. Um, based on what you guys are, are telling us, but essentially we're not too precious with what we use. <laughs> use our stuff, share it, flick it through to friends. Um, we're, we're here to help you out and save you time playing. And that's what we do. Oh, yeah. So how do you keep it free? We charge people who um, want 
want to make it. <laughs> so all of our partners pay for it to be free for you, essentially. So the money that they'd spend typing away and going, oh, I don't know how to do this. How do I figure this out? How do I get it out to teachers? We just go, we will take your money and that'll keep the lights on for Australia. And because we're a not-for-profit, we only charge to pretty much keep the lights on, pretty much. Um, and um, yeah, then it becomes free for teachers. We're all about not making teachers spend any more cash than I know you already do <laughs> um, in your classrooms. So yeah, it, it works really well like that. People are, are happy to offload that most of the time. <laughs> Go from college, but in the year nine campus, we have a separate campus. Um, so there are only like four or five staff actually there. So I kind of only recently got into the whole talking to people on Twitter thing more just because in fact I got bored of talking to four people who worked in the same office as me and they got bored of me telling them the same thing as again. So um, it's definitely until you. Uh, so um, it felt a bit presumptuous to say, ask me about because it suggests I knew what I was talking about. But um, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about something I've tried in standard based grading. I teach mathematics mainly, so um, that was sort of what I uh, was working in. Um, so, yeah, talk to me about anything to do with teaching maths. Uh, and also, because we're at Unite Campus, we try and do a lot of, kind of project based stuff, so I'm still trying to crack the how to do really good with PBL nut, which I'm yet to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if you know, can you do the paper presentation next week? <laughs> uh, <all right. laughs> So here we go. Um, I've told my talk early adventures in standard based grading. And so this is I'm basically going to tell you about something I tried last year and I'm still sort of messing around with. Um, and so it's eight minutes all about me. Um, so the original idea was I, would, I just think a lot about assessment just because I think it kind of guides a lot of what we do. In class, it guides a lot of what the students do, and I've never been fully satisfied with how I assess and how to get bang for my buck and all that kind of thing. Um, and obviously I'm not a fan of just doing a unit topic and then a test at the end of the thing. So I wanted to come up with and kind of mess around a lot with problem solving and that kind of thing, but at the same time that can get really very messy and vague and I'm like, oh but how do I actually know that they can do XYZ thing or whatever? So I was trying to come up with a system that kind of helped me to track sort of developing competency originally kind of the procedural stuff and I sort of expanded from that. Um, and on as the whole kind of growth mindset thing, so things where students can make lots of mistakes and learn from them instead of like, oh, there's a test, if you start too bad, and better next time. So, in fact, so that students couldn't accept getting a bad grade too, rather than kind of going, oh, I got a better grade, I'll better like next time. So sort of the onus was on them to, to improve that. And obviously, that kind of accommodates a bunch of kids because by year nine, um, students are spread out by like, whatever it is, seven years or something, we're not straight. So, um, Anyway, that was kind of the idea. Uh, and also to try to give more specific feedback than, you know, you've got 50% or you, know, you were good at the easy questions or something. So, um, I got this idea originally from Dan Meyer, who anyone who's a math teacher and everybody knows. Um, uh, very, very big, and very famous TED talk. Um, and so I kind of came up with this system that I've been playing around with where I kind of break my subject into my outcomes or standards, set it up as a rubric. And exactly how you do that, I'm not going to talk about because I've tried lots of things, and that's where the, the secret is in a sense. It's, you know, it, it either works or doesn't because of that. But you get a whole pile of outcomes. I'm teaching maths here, so these are all sort of different outcomes that I'm trying to get kids to achieve, and hopefully in language that kind of makes sense to them. There you, go. you can perform single step calculations, you can't understand whether you can do that or not. Um, so you start kind of breaking the unit up into that. I think in the US, this standard based thing is quite big, and a lot of people, they just get their standards out of the curriculum. But I hate our curriculum documents mm -hmm. with a passion. Uh, and so I tried to sort of condense them and throw in a few extra things that I thought were important and that kind of thing. And then, um, anyway, but so you start out with something, I started out with something like that. And so basically, um, then I just had a system whereby, um, yeah, they do some learning. Yeah, that works. Um, and, <laughs> and then, and then you know, you have some form of sort of assessment. Well, the idea is that it gives the students the opportunity to demonstrate kind of competency. Rather than I'm going to test you, it's like here's your chance to show me what you know. So it's kind of putting it a bit onto them. And so I tried a lot of different things with that, but I settled with this fairly simple kind of fortnightly quiz, trying to keep it short, so I can do it regularly because it eats up a lot of time. Um, and my quizzes were sort of rather than 
being broken up sort of into the yeah, this question and suicide, they were, the headings of the questions were the skills. So I had them thinking about the skills going on. And so kids wouldn't do the whole quiz. They'd come in and they'd go, I want to show you that I can do simple calculations and scales. I'll give them that particular piece of paper and they demonstrate that. So they kind of came in with a goal. So that was the idea anyway. Um, and so then um, they do the quiz. Two questions, one question, three questions. Um, and then I have a look at it, record the progress, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Um, and then give it back to them, and, um, and then they get, get the feedback. They wouldn't get it. There's no, it took them a very long time to learn that you don't get a score. There's, so there are no marks. It's not even like the marks seen or hidden. There just aren't any marks. You either, so I might tick or cross or ask questions or whatever, but in the end, it's like, when you demonstrated a certain level of competency at like this skill, you know, that's the outcome. So it's a higher, it's sort of that you're focusing them on the goal rather than on the adding up marks and that kind of thing. Um, again, that's sort of sort of the idea. So, uh, really, this is just a chance for me to show off how I spent a very long time playing in Excel last year, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I did, and programming in VBA was really fun. Um, but um, you, if you do this every fortnight for you know, a big long time, you get a lot of information and you have to kind of collect it. So I designed my own custom spreadsheet, which um, was really, you know, why I wanted to tell you about it, because people in my office don't appreciate how cool it is. Um, <laughs> but I made my own um, basically customised database, so rather than go through tables and collecting information, I can call up the students now, and, and it gives me all of their previous quiz information along here so I can see sort of how they're tracking and that sort of thing. I've even got my own little comments. You know, if this person, oh look, they obviously didn't demonstrate competency at this thing, but because I, I don't know why they did something, if I'm looking at the thing properly, I can see something upside down. Um, and so gradually I kind of, yeah, I can call up their, their information and, uh, and they're just entering it and it sticks it in my database there, um, which I think is a pretty cool spreadsheet. Um, and then we, yeah, when I give them back their work, they aren't good grades, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do it. Um, and also they get access to basically my school spreadsheet. Also pumps out a rubric for them at the end of every cycle, which goes onto my um, OneDrive that the school um, provides with. And they have a link, so they can go on and look at their progress to kind of track. Um, and so here, I've messed around with a lot of different ways of actually kind of recording their progress. I started off with just demonstrated or not demonstrated, which kind of you know works well if you've got really simple things, but then I wasn't too happy with that. So now I'm putting a kind of a you know master option and now I've kind of gone to what a lot of people in the US do where you kind of give them a one, two, three, four for sort of different levels of competency, but then it starts to get really tricky because you start to go, is that a three competency of this? And, as I before, I'm thinking of going backwards to simplify because, of course, the beauty of the system is that the kids would look at this stuff and go, I need to do that, and so they need to be able to kind of understand it. Um, in fact, my favourite moment from this system last year was that because I'd run the quizzes fortnightly, but I'd have kids who wanted to come get ahead, and one time I had over half of the year level doing a voluntary quiz at lunchtime, um, you yeah, know, the campus was kind of silent, and you know, had, yeah, most of them were in the room doing it. And it wasn't because they you know, like they'd stuffed up and they needed to fix the problem, but they were just like, oh, it's getting near the end. And so I'd like to tick off a few more skills and so I had them all in there doing their math skills, which I was quite pleased about. Um, so anyway, uh, you can obviously, again, the nice thing also is I can sort that data quite easily. So because it's on the skills, I go, oh, these are the kids who don't know how to do X, Y, Z. And so I'll do that from time to time. And then we can have a cool little focus workshop on on this kind of thing, it's really easy because I just filter it in my spreadsheet, which I quite like. Um, and the last thing I want to tell you about really quickly, uh, actually, I was going to show it to you, but I might um, is the problem with this, and again, is that making the record system for this would take me most of my holidays. And so at the end of the year, I decided that what I would do is I would make a spreadsheet that would make the spreadsheet for me. So then, starting <laughs> here, all I each term or each topic is all I have to do is I start with a list of students. I'll see if you know, like, don't, don't worry. I start with a list of students and a list of outcomes. And then I press one button. Here we go, let's see if it will work. Here we go, it's 
45 seconds and then they'll remember. So I start with a list of students. Whoop! And then I scroll off the screen. Let's go back. So list of students and then a list of my outcomes, and there's all my yeah, whatever unit. And you can I imagine do this for anything that where you've got stuff you want to tick off. And then it builds the time thing for you. And you can, you can customize it. This is really what I wanted to talk about, was just to show you this. Yes. <laughs> Saves it off to a separate file for you. Yeah. And then you can <laughs> say, so, like programming in VBA, you can use another one. And then it So, there you go. That's um, wow. that's my features in Stanford. I can beat a spreadsheet that has a spreadsheet. That's pretty exciting. I'm not a teacher, but it's pretty exciting. <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Natalie White, uh, I'm an English teacher and I mostly spend my time with middle school students for English and EAL at Crawford Grammar at Lewis Hill. Um, I love to talk, so two minutes is a push, um, but I also want to talk about how students can talk along the way. Um, as an English teacher, and I think as all teachers, sometimes students might not be raising their voices and really expending their agency in the way that we would like. So to try and develop those skills, I think as teachers it's a really important thing in our current context of Twitter rants and social media echo chambers, it's really important I think that we help students develop those critical thinking skills, that ability to actually collaborate with the people around them and to respectfully disagree without just yelling. Um, these are really important skills, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Um, one of the ways that we can do it, that you're all probably already familiar with, is the idea of really explicit ways that students can be encouraged to raise their voice, literally in the classroom. Um, so most of these on the screen here are things that I have just Googled. Um, these are not tremendously complex things, um, and there are some references there as well. Teach thought, um, they do some great things. The one on the top left, uh, some examples that I've used in my class, particularly with my year 8 students, um, as we are working with the text and encouraging the students to use these kinds of sentence stems in our classroom so that they can really articulate their point of view. So, I agree because I really love the last two. I would like to add something further to someone else's idea. Um, the kids also like the phrase, I'd like to piggyback on that. Um, <laughs> great boys love that phrase. And so, using these kind of phrases, they can actually think about how they're building their ideas in a really interesting way. Um, I respectfully disagree because, now, the first couple of times we did this, they used that phrase, um, but they kind of rolled their eyes each time that they said it. Um, but they had to do because. They couldn't just say no and disregard other points of view. That had to be an end point to the rest of that sentence. Um, so there's lots of great samples along the way there. Um, and there are some really great things. Another one, that makes me think about. So that's your viewpoint. That makes me consider something else. It doesn't have to be an argument. We can actually actively collaborate. I know a lot of the time if you do a group discussion, students really are just waiting for a chance to put their hand up and say their answer. And then put their hand down. And that's the beginning and the end of their interaction with thinking. Well, for me, a group discussion is a wonderful place where students can actually listen and build and collaborate and develop and test their own ideas and extend things further. So if we can help them explicitly scaffold some of that thinking, that I think is a, a great way to go. From there, there's also a whole collection of dialogic practices um, which I think students can use to um, really make them accountable for their thinking along the way. You might be familiar with some of these or all of these along the way. Um, there's some great stuff like four ways of saying. They are practicing to say for themselves, to think about what their answer to any sort of question might be. To, you know, it's kind of a version of think, pay, share. Let's actually share with a partner. Let's develop this. But then let's actually restate our new point of view. And that last stage is so important. 
sometimes we might have class discussions and lots of really interesting things are said, but if they don't actually articulate their new perspective at the end of that, sometimes that disappears into the ether. Um, talk tokens are great, it's a really visible way, and I put two colours up there, because you can give students one colour for a question for them to ask, and a colour for when they provide an answer. So it's really visible, they know they've got that red thing in their hands, they really want to ask a question to get rid of that token, um, and similarly to provide an answer for someone else's question. So that kind of physical aspect can work really well. Um, inside outside circles, I love um, where you've got two circles of kids, they're all in pairs, they're having a bit of a chat about a problem, a text, a concept, anything at all um, that they've been prepared for previously. And then after a conversation, you might say, all right, well, the outside circle moves three clockwise, and they move and have another conversation with a different person. And you could have different questions, you could have the same question. Um, I use this to examine text, and so we're looking at We've annotated text, we've explored something, let's actually um, share that with each other and again <coughs> test our ideas um, and make kids accountable. But you're going to be involved in this conversation. You can't just rely on the three noisy kids over there who are going to answer every question for you. Um, you're going to be involved. Now, my two absolute favourites are something the Socratic seminars, which are um, probably well familiar with the idea of students or a discussion being generated by student questions. I love students doing more than me in the classroom. Students should always be working harder than me. And the chance for a conversation to be based on student questions is something that's really valuable. So the Socratic seminar can work with inside-outside circles. It can work and you can have some formal rules um, about how it works. A further step from that is shared inquiry, which is my particular passion along the way. Um, and I've done a little bit of research in terms of my own classroom with shared inquiry. From an English point of view, what I love about Shared Inquiry is that it's really important to use texts that are genuinely open and that have multiple answers, which means we get away from the right answerism of the world, where kids are really just saying things to work out what's in your head. And once they've worked out what's in your head, that's the end of their thinking. While if you're using problems, texts that are open, they actually need to negotiate the meaning or the answer amongst themselves. And you can help them by using your own sentence stems to guide them as part of the process, but you are not at any point in shared inquiry giving kids answers. And the hardest part, for me, is to not give them any reinforcement. So none of the, oh, that's a good answer, Scott. Oh, Jess, yes, you're on the right track there. You have to stop yourself from doing all of those things. It's the hardest thing to do because we do it all day. Um, but actually getting students to do that instead. I like that idea, but I want to add some more. And it turns it over to them. It's a little bit awkward, maybe the first or the second time that you do it. But once this actually becomes a routine as part of what you're doing in the classroom, kids love it. They come into the, after they've read a story for me in the English classroom, they go away, read the story, they generate their own questions, we decide what questions we're going to discuss. I always sneak in a really complex, thematic, problematic question in them, and then they negotiate. The key part of shared inquiry is that we choose one of those questions that they answer at the start, then they have a discussion, and then they go back and re-answer that question. And they get to see physically on the page how their thinking has been transformed by having this discussion. Um, it's great for um, strugglers, who sometimes are at a loss as to have been a text. It's even better for high performers who think they know it all and to actually genuinely hear a fantastic interpretation that they have not thought of that is really quite accessible and um, able to take, be taken from the text is really powerful. So I found that it's transformed students for me at either end of the spectrum in terms of ways that they can use it um, and it's really exciting. If you're interested in shared inquiry, the Great Books Organisation, which is an American organisation, um, they run the process, you can do training, but everything's online. Um, they have a lot of American texts, unfortunately, um, because that's where they're focused, and, but there are lots of Australian texts that are out there as well that are short stories that are open to lots of possibilities. I feel like we just listen to you for hours and hours. 
to speak the language. Um, so formally, I'm uh, Marianne Allery, and I did have that written on my thing, but then someone said my name is too long with my um, Twitter tag, so I've just um, done that as maths. Easy to say. Um, and so some things that I'm really passionate about um, is keynote, and that's um, just something quickly that I'm presenting on tonight. Um, video editing, uh, making learning meaningful, um, and every minute matters. Now, um, I'm taught in Australia, obviously. Um, I've also taught in the UK, and I've taught in Malaysia, both teaching uh, Malaysian teachers better strategies in 21st uh, 21st century pedagogy, and also this year I also taught some refugees in Kuala Lumpur as well. That's just a little bit about um, me um, as an educator. Um, so, keynote, um, I just, I guess I've got a quick two minutes, I could spend hours and hours talking about keynote, um, but um, I guess looking at beyond that it's just not a, another PowerPoint um, as often it's sort of referred to. So this, um, learning how to use keynote um, was life changing for me. Um, learning how to use Twitter and getting connected with all of you was something that was life changing for me. That changed me as an educator um, and how I became more efficient in um, every sense of um, with Twitter, but also now with Keynote, how I can use different things um, to make sure that what I'm teaching, I've already sort of rethought things through. So this um, is a GIF, obviously, that's um, just automated. Um, and then this is some of the different things that I use um, Keynote for. So I use it for um, dictation, spelling tests, uh, reading screens, uh, recording my voice over the slides, um, putting things into groups, sorting my students. Um, there's lots of different things of what I use it for. Again, um, just there's a gift there. Now, the animation tool that is just using this is just a magic move. So it's actually not individual animations or anything like that. It's actually just prepared um, what I call like the golden slide. Um, arrange something how you want everyone to see it and then uh, duplicate the slide. And then you know you arrange it in a scattered sort of a way um, and animate, add a magic move. So you can only do this once. Um, you've got sort of two slides there, um, and then it just sorts the information in that um, golden slide. So um, it's often once you see, show it to the students initially, like, oh my goodness, that's amazing! How did you do that? And it's just like it's really actually not that hard. It's a really, a really um, easy tech thing that you can use um, where you're like. You you can do it in so many different things. You can have odd numbers and even numbers, like you know, really, really basic, and then you know, this equals this, this equals that, or um, lots of different things. I've even done it where um, this week we've been doing um, fractions and percentages and everything, and the student had like everything hidden behind a shape, and then it just came out of the shape, and they're like, oh, that's really cool. It's just doing everything that you're doing normally, but it's just a really quick tech thing that you can do just to make it fun um, and engaging. Likewise, you can do it that you've got um, all the kids in your class on there and you're like, oh, who are you going to work with this week? And then it'll just change in and then you've organised already that, oh, you're working with this people, you're working with this people. Um, so that's just something really um, easy and quick that I sort of like about Keynote. And then I thought, oh, while I'm presenting about this, I just thought also you can, um, it's a really easy way that you can record over the top. Likewise, when you're recording videos and things with your iPhones and things, if you've got everything that's prepared of what you want to present in Keynote, it's really easy just to record um, over the top of it. So um, it's a little bit different than you record and stop everything with a red little button there. Um, and then you just record. You can always see your next screen or your animation or whatever that's coming next there. Um, so uh, earlier this year, I was a digital tech um, teacher and I was we were making um, a video about cyber safety and I said, oh boys, we're going to be making a cyber, cyber safety video and the boys were like, oh, oh, we'll have to work in a group because we'll be recording each other and I'm like, no, 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 we're not going to use uh, like iMovie, we are actually going to use Keynote and they're like, what, how, you, what, how are you going to do that, you know? Um, and so we actually did a really awesome job using Keynote with um, like the screen and things coming up and different things, so it's just expanding um, the mind that you can actually do so much in Keynote and they're like, oh, Miss Ellery, how did you learn how to do all this stuff? And I'm like, oh, I just like learnt and I just, you know, had some digital standard time of my own and learnt and 
unexplored and you know I'm learning things all the time and they're like oh so that's really strange because we just watch YouTube to learn how to do things these days and I'm just like well just take the time and explore because it is a really cool app that um, you can do and in Keynote so you can export as a, like a PDF a PowerPoint movie animated GIF um, images so there's a lot of different things that you can export um, so that you can put it on whatever you need to put it on so that's it for me Okay, so just a couple of small things. Um, I remember that I had to thank people, which I should have done at the start. Um, firstly, Karen Harris is our principal here. I said I wanted to run PD, and she said, yeah, sure, and walked off, and that was all it took. Which <laughs> <laughs> uh, was good, you know, she has faith in what I do. Um, Cameron Malcher sent us his microphone by Express Post at his own expense, because I said I was having a teach me, and he was like, oh, cool. Sounds like podcast material. <laughs> um, and Bernadette mentioned Celia Coffer. Basically, I found her and I said we want to have a teach me. And she tried to give me access to the wiki, but obviously that's a thing that doesn't exist anymore. But basically, she gave us everything we needed, and then it was all set for us. Uh, our next teach me this term is August 30th, which is the National Education Summit. It's on a Friday though, at 3:30. So you either have to turn up and do the free program, which is I think David is speaking as well. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then we'll have a little hour of teach me, or you could pay and come see me in the full talk. Wow, amazing, <laughs> incredible. Um, but whatever. Either way, we intend to have one in term four, 